Let's talk about the Internet of Things, a phrase that's becoming about as ubiquitous as, well, the thing itself. What I hope to do over the next few minutes is to go back to the future and serve up some food for thought on the world of network things that we are designing. The IoT, as it's become known in these acronym happy circles, is meant to refer to a vision of an Internet in which not only can anyone be connected anywhere and anytime, but so too can anything, from the tires of your car to your toothbrush and to aspirin. It was back in 2005 that I chose the Internet of Things as the topic of a publication I edited for the ITU as part of their Internet Report series. Already back then, we had identified four key technology enablers underlying the IoT vision. The tagging of things through auto ID technologies like RFID, sensing things through sensors and actuators, shrinking things through developments in miniaturization and nanotechnology, and finally, things that think through increasingly embedded processing power. Now, although the Internet of Things is a nascent, it's an embryonic market, it's based on developments and techniques that have been around for some time. For instance, it's much to do with radio and radar technology. Early applications were used in IFF during World War II to identify friend or foe aircraft. And we've always had sensors, from your basic thermometer to fire alarms. It's just that they've been getting smaller and more sophisticated. And for some time now, we've been working on making information processing more efficient and more easily embeddable. And of course, that buzzword of buzzwords, convergence, has long been the name of the game. The Internet of Things is perhaps its ultimate form, to the extent that we can imagine it today. Add to this a number of complementary developments in the making. Embedded intelligence in smart cities, homes, and transportation systems. Real-time monitoring, for instance, for the elderly, disabled, or medically vulnerable. Augmented reality, such as memory enhancements, and the combination of the so-called semantic web, that some like to call Web 3.0, with a web of things. The overall vision, as I see it, is one of the interlinking of systems that have previously been isolated, the interlinking of data sets hitherto disparate, and of objects that have seemed to us thus far unconnected or even unconnectable, all as part of our effort to transform this endlessly growing expanse of bits and bytes into exploitable knowledge. And all this, after all, is part of a greater human effort that goes way back to the age-old desire of humanity to control space and time. Indeed, our Internet of Things will enable present and coming generations to add on their own perspectives and their own notions of reality to their objects and to their environments, across not only geographies, but time as well, for the ultimate borderless sharing of global knowledge in real and virtual environments like this one. The promise is of a global network of interconnected physical objects that will soon become as ubiquitous as today's World Wide Web. That's, after all, how the web began, with the creation of associations, categorizations, and hierarchies of data eventually made searchable by you and me. But in an Internet of Things, things, too, will be endowed with their own history, their own identity, their own personality, if you will, leading to a reformulation of our relationship with our environment, past, present, and future. This new network will generate predictable but also random and serendipitous associations between things and between people and things, stimulating whole new forms of interaction and new sets of possible queries. So objects will no longer be, in the words of Marshall McLuhan, neutral or passive. An object will be an active logos or utterance of the human mind or body that transforms the user and his ground. So objects will be reborn, rewritten into being again and again in our mind's eye, just as much as they are in the eye of the network. The user-generated layer placed on self-aware objects that will be capable of, say, blogging and self-organizing, will make them into fully participative and collaborative members of the network and maybe even society. User-generated content will thus merge with thing-generated content, creating a semantic world informed by key patterns, patterns that will help us better leverage an increasingly vast data landscape.
because no one can deny that we've seen over the last few decades an explosion in the availability of data worldwide. The globe's natural systems, its human systems, and its physical objects have always generated an enormous amount of data, but we have until now not been able to fully capture it. The IoT will allow us to do so and to better connect, understand, and exploit it. It will, if you will, help us better hear our planet. And like all electronic media upon which it's founded, it'll not only serve to extend a single human sense, but all five senses simultaneously. In McLuhan's words, the wheel is an extension of the foot, the book an extension of the eye, clothing an extension of the skin, electric circuitry an extension of the central nervous system. As such, we are, if you like, extroverting our human nervous system out into the world, creating a new sort of sensory planetary awareness and responsiveness. The body electric will speak to the planet electric. Now, all this is certainly like magic, the magic of things. But one must not forget that the Internet of Things, while bringing about many new opportunities and challenges, will also inherit the drawbacks of the current Internet. And it'll do so on an infinitely larger but more invisible scale. Privacy is perhaps one of the most important issues in this regard. And generally speaking, privacy principles in and of themselves may be sound, as might the legislation, but the rapid development and ubiquity of technology can make the application, and more importantly, the enforcement of these rules, a harrowing process. So not surprisingly, later on we have an entire session devoted to the subject, and since that's the case, let me take this opportunity to bring forward some other issues which you'll see are not wholly unrelated. Identity, efficiency, decision-making, and disconnect. Identity. One of the most arresting challenges is the fragmentation of identity online. The same person may maintain separate identities on Twitter, Facebook, Wikipedia, Flickr, Second Life, Skype, or should I now say MSN, and so on. Different identities for different contexts and services, which is good because we do sometimes need to keep different contexts separate. But it also creates a lot of difficulty for individual users. Plus, although the multiplicity of these impressions and perceptions may add to one's identity, they can also distract and detract. The online fragmentation of identity is one of the biggest challenges to the realization of the full potential of the networked world. The addition of things that will also need to self-identify will only exacerbate the situation. The multiplicity of channels at our disposal can enrich and empower us, but they can also dilute and confuse us. Efficiency. Nowadays, there's much talk of the speed and efficiency of processes. Speed seems to be everything. And although efficiency is a valid and important goal to pursue in society, particularly in these economic times, in our pursuit of this goal, we must not reduce people to mere IP addresses, to numeric identifiers, to such a point that the identifier begins to take precedence over the substantive aspects of an individual's identity. Because soon there will be a large number of things associated with each person. This will no doubt affect that person's identity, the historicity of their identity, and importantly, the interpretation of it by societal constructs. In this context, the Internet of Things should remain primarily an Internet of people, by people, for people. Decisions. While we're busy adapting to new technologies like location services and iPads and structuring our lives around them, we must take care not to delegate too much of our decision-making and freedom of choice to things and to the machines. Think of the driver obeying his GPS automated voice like a puppet on strings. You have gone the wrong way. Please make a U-turn, putting him and his unlucky fellow drivers in this narrow tunnel in a most dangerous predicament. These digital helpers, though certainly helpful, are shifting more and more control, but also responsibility, away from us and from our internal thought processes. How many students go straight to Google for the most insignificant or the most significant of questions without giving any time to thought and self-reflection? And how many of us do the same? Sometimes I ask myself, is it mind over net or net over mind? 
or have they become indistinguishably entangled? Clearly, we've begun relying unduly on purely external information. And the problem is that there's no end to the amount of information out there. And the more information we download, the more cluttered our hard disks be become. And so too does our brain. In the words of author and journalist James Gleick, information infiltrates us. So do we cease to be its master? Related to this is the question of information authenticity, which is already a growing problem on today's internet. How do we distinguish true information from false information? As Nietzsche aptly said, all things are subject to interpretation. Whichever interpretation prevails at a given time is a function of power and not truth. Nowhere will this hold more true than in a pervasive and dynamic Internet of Things editable by anyone and anything. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we will consciously have to strike a balance between the individual and the collective. We will have to find time away from the network to ensure that our capacity for independent thinking, upon which all progress rests, is maintained. So to conclude, although the landscape for the Internet of Things may seem overwhelming and chaotic at this time, let's be inspired by that chaos. Take, for example, the Chinese symbol for chaos, which shows an image of a new plant breaking ground. The modern translation is that chaos is a place where great dreams begin. A place, therefore, that takes us right back to painting our future and all the wondrous things, as Picasso says, that we may think into it.